What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. We've talked about fluid overload. If you haven't watched it, make sure that you go back and watch that video. But what happens when we don't have enough fluid? Then we start to experience fluid volume deficit. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. So what is fluid volume deficit? Well, fluid deficit occurs when the fluid intake of the body is not sufficient enough to meet the body's fluid needs. So compartments that are usually affected by fluid deficits would be your intravascular space. You have a fluid loss in your blood vessels. Your intracellular space, you have a fluid loss in your cells. And your interstitial space, where you have fluid loss outside of your vessels. So there's two major types of fluid losses. We have sensible water loss as well as insensible water loss. And we went much more into depth of this in my previous video about fluid movement. But again, we have sensible water loss, which means it can be measured. You lose it and you know you've lost it. So what are some examples? We have vomiting, um, urine output, as well as diarrhea. When it comes to insensible water loss, that is not measurable. So you're losing it, but you don't know that you're losing it. So we lose water insensibly by respirations, as well as sweating when it comes to diaphoresis. So fluid losses can also have an effect on our osmolality. Our osmolality is the measure of how much one substance has dissolved in another substance or the concentration of solutes in water. So the body should have equal solutes inside and outside of the cells. If there are more solutes outside of the cells, then fluid is going to move out. If there's more solutes inside of our cells, then fluid is going to move in. So just like with fluid volume overload, with fluid deficit, we have three types of dehydration. We have isotonic dehydration, hypotonic dehydration, and hypertonic dehydration. So let's begin by looking at isotonic dehydration, meaning that there are equal losses. So water and dissolved electrolytes are lost in equal portions, known as hypovolemia. I'm sure you've heard that before. Isotonic dehydration is the most common type of dehydration, and it results in a decrease of circulatory blood volume and an adequate tissue perfusion because of that loss of circulatory blood volume. So causes for this could be inadequate intake of fluids and solutes, fluid shifts between compartments, that happens quite a bit, excessive losses of isotonic body fluids, trauma, diarrhea, vomiting, and excessive sweating. Next we have our hypertonic dehydration, meaning that there's more substance and less water. So water loss exceeds electrolyte loss. The clinical problem that occurs results from the alterations in the concentration of specific plasma electrolytes. Fluid moves from the intracellular compartment into the plasma and interstitial fluid spaces causing cellular dehydration and shrinkage. So causes of this um, condition that increases fluid loss are excessive perspiration when it comes to sweating, um, hyperventilation, ketoacidosis, you'll see this a lot with our diabetic patients, prolonged fevers, diarrhea, early stage kidney disease can also cause this as well as diabetes insipidus and water deprivation. And lastly, we have hypotonic dehydration, meaning that we have more water and less substance. So the electrolyte loss exceeds that water loss. So clinical problems that can occur as a result of these fluid shifts between compartments cause a decrease in plasma volume. Fluid moves from the plasma and interstitial spaces into our cells, causing plasma volumes to decrease and the cells to swell and potentially burst from all of that fluid volume moving into our cells. So causes can be chronic illness, you could have excessive fluid replacement with hypotonic solutions, kidney disease, chronic malnutrition, or patients that just won't eat, um, as well as hyponatremia. So let's talk a little bit about fluid shifting. So fluid shifts from the vessels into those interstitial spaces. Um, we have a diminished organ perfusion because the body is going to shunt 
that remaining fluid to his life-sustaining organs, just like we would see with sepsis. When we're having these fluid losses, they are going to start shunting whatever nutrients and oxygen that they have left to our brain, our heart, and our lungs because those are the things that are gonna keep us alive. So the other organs are gonna to start to take a hit, thus leading to that diminished organ perfusion. We also have hypovolemic shock. If it's not treated, the body can develop hypovolemic shock, causing our organs to shut down. And then lastly, we have multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. We've got multiple organs that are shutting down. I would highly recommend that you check out that systemic inflammatory response syndrome, as well as the multiple organ dysfunction syndrome videos to help kind of put together a lot of those processes that affect our bodies. So what is our patient going to look like when we're having fluid deficit problems? Well, when it comes to our cardiovascular system, they're going to have thready increased pulse rates. The heart rate will go up to try to compensate for that loss of volume initially. Um, we're going to have a decreased blood pressure as well as orthostatic hypotension because there's not enough volume within our bloodstream. We're going to have flat neck veins and hand veins while they're in a dependent position, diminished peripheral pulses, decreased central venous pressure, as well as dysrhythmias. As we start to have electrolyte changes, you're going to start to see the heart take a hit and you're going to start to see these dysrhythmias. When it comes to respiratory, we're going to have an increased respiratory rate and depth, as well as dyspnea. It's going to be very hard to breathe without that fluid that we need. Neuromuscular, we're going to have a decreased central venous system activation. That's going to be shown with either lethargy or potentially even the patient going into a coma. Fever, depending on the amount of fluid loss that has transpired, as well as skeletal muscle weakness. When it comes to our renal, we're going to have a decreased urinary output because we don't have the volume and that urinary output that you are going to get is going to be highly concentrated and very, very dark. Our integumentary system, we're going to have very dry skin. We don't have the fluid that we need, poor turgor as well as tenting, and even dry mouth is going to occur. When it comes to our gastrointestinal system, we're going to have decreased motility and decreased bowel sounds. If we're starting to shunt all of that fluid to our life-sustaining organs, you know, your GI system really isn't something that's going to keep you alive, so everything is going to start to slow way, way down. Constipation can start to occur. The patient might start to feel thirsty, and then you're going to have a decreased body weight dependent on how bad that fluid deficit is. So when it comes to our laboratory finding, like we talked about before, with fluid volume overload, everything is going to be decreased. Why? Because all of that excess fluid is diluting our system. Whereas with our fluid deficits, everything is going to be increased because we don't have enough volume. Nothing's getting diluted. Everything is highly concentrated. So you're going to have an increased serum osmolality, increased hematocrit, blood urea, nitrogen, BUN levels, serum, sodium is going to be increased, as well as your urinary specific gravities. When it comes to management of a fluid deficit patient, you're going to do a lot of the same things that you do with fluid overload. You were going to monitor intake and output. It's extremely important that we monitor it because we need to determine the efficiency of our treatment. Daily weights need to occur to determine if treatment is working, as well as it helps indicate if fluid deficits are becoming more severe. And vital signs, we need to assess for those hypovolemic shocks as well. So what kind of interventions are we looking at when we have a fluid deficit patient? Well, electrolytes could be one. We can either give them PO or IV if we are having um, replacement deficits, especially when we start replacing all of these fluids. Um, blood transfusions, trauma causing hemorrhaging. So if you've got somebody whose main cause of hypovolemia is blood, then you need to replace blood with blood. You can give isotonic solutions, but it really is only going to take you so far. Ultimately, you're going to have to give some kind of blood product. IV fluids is the most important treatment when it comes to fluid deficits. Isotonic solution specifically is the most commonly used fluid volume deficit treatment because there's no shifts between the cellular and extravascular spaces when it comes to replacing those fluid losses. So you have equal solute and water and normally you'll see normal saline and sometimes lactated ringers depending on what's going on with their electrolytes. 
Hypotonic solutions help push water back into the cell. So we're having that cellular dehydration. This really helps those shriveled up cells bounce back again and become nice and thick and moist and beautiful. So again, more water than solute, and that's usually your half normal salines. Hypertonic solutions pulls water out of the cell into that extravascular space. So there's more solutes than water, and you see that a lot with our D5 normal salines as well as our D5 half normal salines with our diabetic patients that may have been on an insulin drip before. And we also want to monitor for fluid volume overload. If you haven't watched my previous video on fluid volume overload, I highly recommend you go back and watch it because we go over how to monitor for what's happening during that fluid volume overload if we are giving IV fluids during fluid deficits. So patient education, how are we going to educate these patients to prevent this in the future? Well, plan activities, especially when patients are exercising, they need to make sure that they're drinking water and that they're not excessively exerting themselves to the point where they're having these massive fluid deficits. You need to remind your elderly population that they need to drink. As they get older, the elderly may be become more forgetful. Not all elderly people become more forgetful, but some do. So you have to remind them to drink water appropriately and often. Um, management of chronic diseases, they need to be following their doctor's orders. They need to be taking their medications. If there was any kind of lifestyle changes prescribed to them, they should be following those, as well as diet modifications, depending on what the doctor prescribed. So one of the goals when we're looking at fluid volume deficit patients, well, we want to make sure that we're restoring that fluid balance. We need to correct electrolyte imbalances with these patients if they are occurring. And we also need to eliminate or control the underlying cause of the fluid deficit. I hope that this video was helpful for you in passing your nursing exams like a boss. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure that you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe as well as like this video. I also have a website at www.nursechung.com where I will have NCLEX style questions as well as additional resources with each of my videos. So make sure that you check that out. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will speak with you all again soon. Bye.